There's a passage where the Buddha compares the practice to building a house. You put up the different beams and the rafters, and the top piece of wood, the ridge pole, has to depend on the, the lower beams and rafters. Yet at the same time, they depend on it. They are not solid, they are not secure until the ridge pole is in place. This is an image for the different strengths we need in the path, need in the practice. Conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration. These are like the beams and the rafters going up. And discernment is the ridge pole, the discernment that leads to the right ending of stress. And as our conviction and persistence and mindfulness and con concentration are going up, they're going to be a little wobbly. They're not 100 percent sure. It's only when we start having direct insight, when our discernment really starts yielding results, that's when everything is solid and in place. And the Buddha has us be very clear on this fact. We don't have to pretend that we know things that we don't know. In fact, pretending that you know something you don't know, he said, is, is a sign of defilement, and it gets in the way of actual knowledge. But we do have to learn how to deal with uncertainties. Deal with likelihoods. We're working on working hypotheses. The hypothesis that our actions do matter, and that the training of the mind is the most direct way of living skillfully in this world and also finding release from suffering. As a Jamahobu once said, if you, if you could take out nirvana and all the noble attainments so that people could actually see them, he said nobody in the world would want anything else. But they can't be taken out and shown like that. The Buddha did, however, teach in a way that would try to give rise to a sense of conviction. He had seen in the second watch of the night, on the night of his awakening, that beings fare well and fare poorly in line with their actions. Their actions are in turn are determined by their views, and their views are determined by their respect or lack of respect for noble ones, their conviction or lack of conviction in noble ones. And so after he himself had explored this principle of action further into the mind, into the intentions that were arising and passing away in the present moment, was able to see things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. The Four Truths about stress, and the Four Truths about the, what they call the affluence. There seem to be two stages in that last knowledge. Seeing in terms of the Four Noble Truths, that led to what's called the, the arising of the dhamma eye. And once the duties appropriate to the Four Noble Truths have been completed, that's when he cut through the effluent of views, effluent of ignorance, the effluent of sensuality. Mind was totally released. In forty nine days, he experienced the bliss of awakening, the bliss of release. But when the time came to teach, first he saw how difficult it would be because he couldn't just take it out and show it to people. But he also realized it would be important that in teaching right view to people, he also had to inspire them with respect, inspire them with a sense of confidence. And so he taught in many different ways. Sometimes he would use his psychic power, sometimes he would use sheer force of reason. Not that the reason would prove his truth, but simply that they would show that they made sense. So it's a way of giving, giving rise to respect, giving rise to a sense of confidence. 
He'd use analogies to make things clear. He'd actually give people checklists, questionnaires with which they could question themselves as they practice, so they could begin to gauge for themselves how well they were doing, how effectively they were putting his teachings into practice. In other words, the Buddha was an extremely responsible teacher. All as a way of giving rise to confidence in his listeners. And even then, he was very careful to make sure that they didn't overestimate their knowledge, overestimate what they had gained by listening to him. There's that story of the man who listened to the Buddha one day, and he went back to tell a friend, oh, this Buddha, he's, he really is a Buddha, he's really awakened. And so the second man said, how do you know? And the first man said, well, I see people come to disprove his teachings before they even open their mouths. He's taught them in such a way that they've abandoned their views and take him on as their teacher. That's the sign that he's awakened. So the second man wants to go see the Buddha. He goes and meets him, and he tells him what the first man told him. And the first man, in giving his an explanation of how he knew the Buddha was awakened, said it's like an elephant hunter going into the elephant wood and seeing the footprints of the elephant. He knows he's found a bull elephant. And so when the second man tells this analogy of the Buddha, the Buddha said that's not the right use of the analogy. The elephant hunter goes into the wood, sees large footprints, but he doesn't immediately jump to the conclusion that the, this must be a bull elephant. He wants a bull elephant to do some work. But those large footprints might be the footprints of, he says, dwarf females with big feet. But they look promising, so he follows them. As he goes along, he sees scratch marks in the trees. And again, he doesn't come to the conclusion that these must be the scratch marks from the tusks of a big bull elephant, because some female elephants are tall and have tusks, but it looks promising. So even though he doesn't know for sure that he's found his bull elephant, yet he follows the footprints, and finally he sees a bull elephant standing in a clearing, and he knows for sure that he's found the bull elephant. In the same way, the good results we get from the practice, developing the precepts, developing mindfulness and alertness, overcoming the hindrances, getting the mind in states of concentration. These are like the footprints. They don't prove that the Buddha was awakened, but they give us encouragement. We see the good results that come when we train the mind. And this strengthens our conviction. We keep up our persistence. We try to become more mindful, further our powers of concentration. And even when we gain psychic powers, it's still it's the scratch marks high up in the trees. It's still not proof. I've told you that story of the woman who was a student of a John Fuhr. And at first I didn't realize this about her. It was years later I began to get a sense of maybe why this had happened. But she started developing a sense of where there were hungry ghosts around. Sometimes they were under stairs, sometimes they were hiding behind the doors and gates, really miserable little places. And she didn't like seeing them, it unnerved her. And at the same time she wasn't 100 percent sure that she was actually seeing these things or if she was getting a little crazy. And John Fung said, well, whether they're true or not, ask them questions. Ask them why they're there. What did they do to become hungry ghosts? And then see if you can help them. And so she did. She found out the various things that they had done. And sometimes she could help them with their meditation, sometimes she couldn't. And then after a while it all stopped. But in the meantime, she learned something about the principle of karma. Again, she wasn't 100 percent sure that she was actually seeing real hungry ghosts. But the lesson she learned about karma was, was important. 
I found out later that she'd been interested in magic spells. The whole thing, of course, about magic spells is you gain power over other people. And this knowledge made her stop and realize that even though you may gain power over other people with magic spells, it's, it's got its karmic consequences. But even that kind of knowledge is not 100% sure. It's just the scratch marks up in the trees. It's only when you have your first experience of the Dharma Eye, seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths, and, as the Buddha says, you touch the deathless. You see the deathless, you know it for yourself. That's when you found your bull elephant. And that's when the knowledge is sure the Buddha really is awakened. He really does know what he's talking about. So it's important as we practice. Sometimes we read about the, the Ajans, or we read about the Ajan students and the psychic powers they had, and we feel envious that they had a lot more evidence than we do. A lot more encouragement in their practice. Well, it's not necessarily so. You can have these experiences and still not really trust them. And sometimes, if you misuse that kind of knowledge, it can backfire on you. And particularly if you start putting that 100% good housekeeping seal of approval, this must be true, whatever I see in my meditation must be true, that really sets you up for a fall. Because this kind of knowledge is uncertain. Just like our normal everyday perceptions can be clouded by our defilements, psychic knowledge can be clouded by defilement too. The only sure way is to get rid of those defilements, your greed, aversion, and delusion. So that someday you'll find your bull elephant. You'll see for yourself that what the Buddha taught was true. The Buddha really did know what he was talking about. Or to get back to the house, the knowledge you finally got the ridge pole in place, everything else is solid. Your conviction has now been confirmed. Your persistence, your mindfulness and concentration have shown results. Your discernment has shown results. And it's in that freedom that's where the knowledge lies. You know that you've understood the principle of cause and effect. You know you understand your own actions because you've used that knowledge to the point of freedom. So happiness is totally unconditioned. And even though we'd like to have some 100% certainty before we set forth on this path, this, it can't be provided. But you look around. You see what other paths are available. You see that this one makes sense, that it does give good results. And so like the footprints, you follow it. You keep on working on the rafters and the beams of the house. Knowing that the beams are not quite solid and not pretending that they are. Because if you pretend that they are, then you just stop. But it's that courage to act on your convictions. That's what puts everything in place eventually. So you see for yourself. That's when you know your knowledge is sure, because you've tested it again and again and again. Refined your powers of perception, refined the subtleness of your discernment. That's when you have your guarantee. <laughs>